lucky enough to travel all over the world to some pretty amazing places. But if I'm honest, only a few of them have truly captured my heart. You see, I came to this country two years ago and I was blown away by the food and the culture and the history and the hunting. There are four different types of Ibex that you can only find right here. And I've already hunted two of them. So now I'm back to hunt the other two. And of course, for the food and the culture and the history and the wine. This is Spain. Forget the hunting, we'll just drink the wine and do masks. Okay. <laughs> well, Nick, how you doing back there? Have a seat, children. I have a story to tell you. But first, in order for me to tell you this story, I need to take you back one year earlier and show you why I fell in love with this country. I took in the Spanish beaches and the cities. Unlike any place I've ever seen, and I love it. And the food. I learned that I definitely did not like these. I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't like that at all. I learned the proper way to peel an orange. He wouldn't let me do this because he has a special way of doing it. I learned that there are a lot of castles and an overwhelming amount of history. I met my guide and outfitter who ended up becoming one of my best friends, Antonio Terrell, who owns and operates Eber Hunting. I hunted Adad sheep for the first time. I went to Hollywood in Spain. And there, Antonio and I reverted back to little children and had a gunfight. I ate octopus for the first time. Takes a while to chew. I met jamón. Nick, I want to introduce you to the jamón. <laughs> which I learned is a traditional food in Spain that is a pig aged in salt for three years, air dried at 3,000 meters above sea level. I hunted for the Ronda Ibex in the Andalusia province and I hunted for the southeastern ibex in the Sierra Nevada mountains. In Spain, there are four types of ibex that you can only find here. And to harvest all four of them is called the Spanish Ibex Grand Slam. And on my return visit to Spain, I'm trying to accomplish just that. I'm once again hunting with one of the greatest ibex guides and outfitters on the planet. Antonio Terrell, owner of Eber Hunting. And once I've met up with him, our hunt begins in the tiny village of El Raso. But first, we wait. It's my first day back in Spain. My buddy Antonio here. Old friends, two years ago I was here, hunted the southern two Ibex. Now we're gonna hunt the northern two. We're starting here in Grados. And here we wait for the rangers because you can't go hunt a national park without a park ranger. Makes sense, right? <laughs> Here they are. Here they come? Yes. I love it, and this little Suzuki. <laughs> My cowboy ranger. <laughs> Our first target is the Grados Ibex, which lives only in the Sierra de Grados mountain range in central Spain. These mountains cover the provinces of Avila, Salamanca, Cáceres, Toledo, and the proud capital of Spain, Madrid. Now that the park rangers are here, I'm immediately reminded just why it's so important to have an experienced outfitter like Antonio to guide me through this journey. I haven't been here five minutes already, and it's very, very obvious just how different hunting here is. We're about to go into a national park, so I understand there's a lot of paperwork. Antonio tells me it's like this for any kind of big game hunting. It just makes you appreciate how really good we have it. You go to the gas station, buy a tag over the counter, and just go hunt. 40 documents later, and we're still talking about it over here. It's crazy. I don't understand a damn thing they just said, except for Ariba, which I think means go. In El Rosa, Spain, we're about to head up the mountains with these two guys, who I just met. But before we do that, one of the guides named Javier has invited us to his house to show us something special. Look at the tattoo chest here. Is yours? Yeah. 
Unbelievable. Just like any country, Spain is full of all sorts of cultural uniqueness. And one thing you can bet on about Spain is that they are serious about their cured meats. And just one step into Javier's house will show you that by that measure, Javier is definitely a red-blooded Spaniard. All the dark ones are Ibex, and, and then you mix it with pork? Yeah. Fit, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Otherwise, otherwise, it's too dry, you know? So all the mold, the mold on the outside and everything, that's okay? Yes, this is not only, this is because it's uh, drying. Okay, yeah. While it was definitely a little hard for me to get past the mold thing, I will admit that I was impressed that every single room in this guy's house had sausage hanging in it. So this is new. Now that is dedication. It also got me thinking, I wonder if I can get my wife to sign off on something like this. Now, I'm gonna give up on that idea right now. Anyway, just when I thought Javier couldn't get any more cool, I found out that he also makes wine. You're my new best friend because you make the wine, you make the wine, you make the sausages, and you're a hunter. And then to seal the deal for the world's coolest Spaniard award, he also plays guitar. And you know that I had to get in on that action. You can tell him I'll play him a traditional country song from the US. <laughs> Willie Nelson? Huh? Nelson. Willie, Willie Nelson? Nelson. Yeah, exactly. This is definitely the first time I've ever played country music under some sausages. Blue moon of Kentucky, keep on shining. Shine on the one that's gonna let me blue. Blue moon of Kentucky, keep on shining. Shine on the one that's gonna let me blue. On a moonlit night, the stars are shining bright. Whisper on high, blue moon, say goodbye. I said, Blue moon of Kentucky, keep on shining. Shine on the one that's gonna let me blue. There they go. I don't know what they're saying. They're probably saying, hey, that stupid American needs to hurry up. <laughs> Whatever it is, I'm ready. Finally, we're hunting. And after a few miles hike up the mountainside, we stopped the glass for the first time. Oh yeah, I see him. And we immediately spot a nice ram. So the, I see the horns of the, the one next to the bush. And then I hear an unusual sound that's getting louder and louder. We're looking for goats, just not that kind with the bells around their neck. <laughs> I guess I could go get some milk. First the sausage, now the goats. Spain, you've surprised me again. It's my second morning hunting Grados Ibex in Spain. And as we drive close to the area we'll be hunting, my guide Antonio stops alongside the road to show me a piece of history that I will never forget. This is incredible. This is literally an old Roman road. Yes, it's thousands of years old. Thousands of years. Everyone knows that the Romans built one of the largest and most important civilizations in human history. You can't talk about the history of the world without talking about the conquests and the technological advancements of the Roman Empire. And the scope and size of that empire, to say the least, is impressive. It included nearly everything around the Mediterranean Sea and stretched from parts of Asia all the way to Britain. And to maintain a territory like that, you needed to be able to safely move things like food, civilians, military, and communications. And to do that, the Romans built an extensive permanent network of roads. The Romans invaded what is today called Spain around 218 BC. But the native people of the Iberian Peninsula didn't go quietly, and it took the Romans nearly 200 years to complete that conquest. As the Roman Empire expanded, so did its network of roads. And by the late ages of the empire, 113 provinces were interconnected by 372 roads 
totaling over a quarter of a million miles. 50,000 of those miles were paved just like the road that I'm standing on today. And they did that often with slave labor from prisoners of war, one stone at a time. And I'd say they did a damn good job because many of those roads are still here today. Well, judging by the construction in Nashville, this is proof positive that they don't make them like they used to. Well, after learning all about the Roman roads, we get back on the good old blacktop. We drive for a few minutes, park the truck, and start hiking. And just an hour into our hike, things start to get interesting. We spotted our first contender, at least he did. And I don't know how the heck he found it. I could barely find those in the binos, 600 yards away. A solo big male sitting there. So now they're having some intelligible discussion about whether or not it's a shooter. The Sierra de Gredos is one of the most extensive mountain ranges of the central system of Spain. The central system is a mountain range that lies in the center of the Iberian Peninsula and it has a length of over 370 miles. The Sierra de Gredos is the highest and most rugged part of the central system. It has five river valleys and to cross these river valleys is often very dangerous. Ho, 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 ho. After Antonio barely made this jump, I decided to throw my gun and my pack ahead of me. Surely after that, I'd have no problem. I was wrong. Oh. Slippery right there. <laughs> All I have to say for that is thank God for my new buddy Javier. As we climbed higher and higher, the fog began to roll in and it made stalking conditions often impossible. We continually had to stop and wait, sometimes for hours. And as time wasted away, we began to worry that we were gonna run out of enough daylight to get close enough to the big Ibex that we'd spotted. I mean, right now, right now it was 5, 520. Yeah. So I mean, it's very possible 200, we'll, we'll get that. Yeah. But we weren't giving up yet. The apex, it's behind these rocks. We have to stalk very quietly and hidden. Mm -hmm. And maybe we come out in a short distance. Yeah. The Grados ibex is the largest of the Spanish ibex species, and it carries the largest horns, which have a unique curve and a spiral turn of more than 180 degrees while turning backward. Their horns progressively decrease in thickness from the base to their extremely thin tips. I've already seen several impressive ibex on this trip, but I gotta tell you, as we crawled into position and I got my first good look at this lone monarch, I was blown away and I was ready for my shot. Mother Nature, on the other hand, she had other plans. We made it within 100 yards of this shooter. And now we're stuck because of the fog. We can't do anything now, or at least see him. He's right there. We have no choice but to wait out the fog and hope that this giant doesn't move. And after an hour of waiting, we finally got the break we were looking for. There's nothing like the feeling of flying all the way over the ocean, hiking up a mountain with good people, and then doing what you came to do. Good shot, man. Oh, Nick. Bueno, gracias. Gracias. Great diving. Holy moly. There's nothing worse than being put on ice for a long period of time. In this case, the fog. And I'm so glad he's laying right there because if he had toppled, that would have been a tough track job. <gasps> the Spanish celebrate everything with food. 
So after a quick snack and a moment to appreciate a great day in the Grados Mountains, we begin the long hike down. As excited as I am to have number three of the four Spanish Ibex on my back, my favorite memory of this trip are the new friends I've made. Separated slightly by language, but brought together by the timeless bonds of food, drink, and the thrill of the hunt. What do you do when you get done hunting on the mountain? You go underneath yes. the mountain. On New Year's Eve of 1963, five kids were wandering the woods on a hill known as Cerro de la Aguia. They saw steam coming out of a hole, and after they grabbed some ropes and lanterns, they lowered themselves down almost 200 feet. When they found the bottom, they couldn't believe their own eyes. They had stumbled upon one of the greatest Spanish geological discoveries of the century, and after six months of construction to make an entrance, the cave was open to the public July 18th, 1964. Today, I'm headed down to check it out for myself with the help of this guy, Mario, the Spanish cave guide. We begin our journey underground step by step to a depth of 164 feet. The temperature gets cooler until it settles at a steady 62 degrees, which it stays at all year long. You have to watch your head because the passages are small until you get to the bottom. Wow. And then things open up into one of the most breathtaking things I've ever seen. Wow. This is incredible. Whoa. That is unbelievable. Yeah. It's, it's pristine. The first thing that strikes me when I see this is that the caves I've seen in the United States aren't this perfect. I mean, they've been open to people, uh, some of them for over a hundred years and people touch them and they break stuff off. But this is perfectly white and perfectly preserved because they discovered it yeah. in the 60s, right? Yeah, so, 60s, yeah. so they knew enough to protect it. This uh, cave, it's very strange that uh, it's in a special point because all the mountains around from Gredos and all these other areas are granite areas. Granite, granite yeah. yeah. So then this is very strange that they have this because kind it's of- it's one spot that just yes. isn't granite. It's just here one point of all the mountains all around. Wow. This cave is absolutely incredible, but it's even more incredible when you consider how these formations came to be. The space of this cave is essentially formed by the flow of rainwater eroding away the limestone over tens of thousands of years. The beautiful formations hanging from the top of the cave are called stalactites. They're formed when water containing calcium from the limestone rock drips from the ceiling of a cave. As the water comes into contact with air, some of that calcium hardens, and over thousands of years, an elongated formation begins to take shape. The formations that grow up from the bottom are called stalagmites and they're formed essentially with the same principle, only in reverse. Now here's where it gets crazy. Some of these formations are over 20 to 30 feet long or more. And now imagine that to create just 10 centimeters of that can take over a thousand years. When you start doing that math, it takes this place from incredible to mind blowing. I think honestly, this is one of the coolest things I've done on a hunting trip. And this is why I love this sport so much because it's not just about going out and killing something. For me, a hunting trip is about stuff like this because right above here is where we're hunting. But right here, all we had to do is scratch the surface a little bit and we found something completely cool and unique to this area. And that is what hunting's all about. I swear, for me, that's what it is. Next week, my adventure with Antonio in Spain continues. I learn how to make olive oil. That's really good. I hunt for truffles. Yes, I said truffles. And no, I'm not talking about the chocolate. No, it's pretty cool. And of course, I hunt for the Besady Ibex in hopes of finishing my Spanish Ibex Grand Slam. Until then, hasta la vista.